Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us uh, for today's webinar, How to Start Winning with New Household Acquisition. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Um, we will send out a link to the, today's recording in a follow-up email, uh, along with um, uh, a copy of the slides. And so if you have any questions, um, you know, certainly uh, submit those in the Q&A feature or in the chat box, and we will get those to you as well. Uh, and so today we have Dan Marks from Infusion um, going to speak to, um, you know, again, just, uh, you know, how Infusion uh, can assist with, you know, what are often, you know, some of the biggest challenges for our institutions trying to gain new household and retail uh, accounts. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dan. Dan. Thanks, Sean. Uh, double check audio is good. Still. Audio is good. Right. You're all good. To awesome. Go. Awesome. Well, yeah, so the, the fundamental premise we're talking about today is how to drive uh, new household acquisition at your institution at, in the supply. And a lot of what we're going to talk about applies whether you're a bank or a credit union. Um, and and the uh, our perspective is informed from spending a lot of time in banking. Uh, I was a, a, a two-time CMO at a regional bank before joining Infusion. And so one of the things I've observed uh, from my time at a couple different banks and uh, with our work with clients all over the country is random acts of lead generation just create frustration for everyone involved. And what I mean by that is uh, if we're saying, hey, we want to you know, drive some new leads or new households or new or prospect or external marketing, there's a lot of different words used, but fundamentally, if I'm trying to get... Uh, uh, customers or members who don't bank with me to start banking with me, let's do some marketing stuff. Well, if that's, if it's just kind of a, let's throw some stuff against the wall and see what works, or maybe let's run some, let's rely on, you know, a lot of just top, top of funnel um, without really understanding how it drives just over and over. That's, that's frustrating for the, for the marketing team because it's kind of start stop. It's frustrating for the sales team because it's, okay, what do I do with these leads? Uh, maybe frustrated with the branches. Uh, it's certainly frustrating for the CFO because he's seeing these big spins uh, without uh, really knowing, okay, what did I get for that spend? And so just everybody is frustrated by random acts of, of marketing and certainly random acts of, of lead generation. Uh, contrast that with, um, we, we can and have, and we'll show you how to create a predictable new relationship generation engine, uh, but it requires the discipline. And so a lot of these words are, are considered very intentionally. It's that discipline and process. Uh, certainly creativity is a, is a key ingredient in that process. So we're gonna walk through, uh, touch on, on how that plays. But it is truly a discipline and a process uh, that it takes to 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 do the hard work to become predictable and um, and successful in this space. So, does that premise make sense to everybody? Uh, hopefully, it does. Uh, like Sean said, if you want to chat questions as we go along, we'll do we'll, we'll do our best to spot those. If for some reason we don't. Uh, uh, answered along the way, we'll we'll certainly make time. We have, make time at the end uh, to make sure all your all your questions are answered. Um, and so, when we talk about the discipline uh, required to create a predictable uh, new household generation engine, um, like all good processes and discipline, we've got a diagram that that processes it. But um, what we what we've seen is really uh, the starting point is a robust set of analyses to, to, to dimensionalize, okay, what are we actually trying to accomplish? What does that mean in terms of uh, sizing, impact, resources? So it's some analysis, and then um, our point of view is that analysis can be uh, even richer when you're, when you're pulling in perspectives uh, from people like Infusion who do this all the time. Um, and so you're gaining that experience. You're not just trying to trying to navigate uh, on your own. But uh, analysis, and we, we have abbreviated that on this chart with an OA, an opportunity analysis, feeds into planning. So you're gonna do an analysis, then you're gonna go through a planning process to say, okay, 
based on the opportunity, what should I do? What do the tactics look like? And then execute. And, and probably the most important part of this process on the, on the slide is executing, tracking, and refining. Uh, because one of the constant themes you'll see as we go through this uh, presentation is it's not a fire and forget type process. It is not uh, do a bunch of stuff and then just hope for the best. Uh, and there are there are nuances that that are different for every institution. There are there are specific nuances uh, for your institution that will mean that some of the some of the elements are going to be a little bit different. Um, but that process requires you know kind of doing testing and refining. Uh, so that's what we mean about creating a data driven discipline uh, for uh, for growth for new household acquisition. Um, and so uh, when it comes to assessing opportunity for doing that analysis, there's really three fundamental questions, um, you know, kind of in the, uh, in, in the, uh, the immortal words of, of a Ted Lasso, uh, asking the right questions are real is, is really kind of the key to understanding, um, what, what's ahead of us. And so, uh, maybe counterintuitively our, our, point of view is the first place to start when you're talk, talking about new household acquisition is have I maximized my relationship expansion opportunities? Um, have Am I penetrating all that I can get from my current customers? Uh, am I taking advantage of the opportunities to, to migrate somebody from a secondary relationship to a primary checking relationship uh, that already have a relationship? Uh, and the reason for that is um, the ROI in every time, every case that we've measured it is better for relationship expansion. And so having a solid relationship expansion uh, foundation in place will, will give you the best bang for the buck. Uh, certainly is, that tends to be very popular with the CFOs to say, am I getting the, the biggest bang for the buck? But then also it's, it's a powerful platform in terms of informing things uh, like brand standards and, and a lot of things that we're going we're gonna to touch on in prospect acquisition. So that's the first question. Um, the second key question uh, for understanding the prospect uh, opportunity is, what is the opportunity to reach high propensity prospects? So not just everybody, um, you know, it's not that hard to run a Google search uh, or, or, you know, whatever your preferred search engine or ask chat GPT, how many, um, you know, how many rooftops are in my, uh, are in my, you know, two or three cities or five or six cities, whatever it is, and add them up and say, okay, this is my opportunity. The, 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 the reason we emphasize high propensity is some of those households that may not be members or customers are never going to become customers. And so understanding where you're going to get the best, the best bang for the buck is really important uh, to getting off off the ground uh, and 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 uh, getting as fast a start as possible, and then also uh, getting to a, a good ROI as quickly as possible. Um, and and so uh, we're going to walk through uh, how do you actually uh, understand what are those propensity uh, prospects versus the low propensity prospects. And then the third big key strategic question is, am I prepared to systematically retain and expand new to bank relationships? Um, and uh, the reason for that is I think we all know new relationships, particularly new single service relationships, are the least sticky relationships there are in banking. And so um, it's not enough to just get the new prospect into the door, but uh, um, onboarding that relationship very effectively, uh, making sure that they're engaged certainly in the the key uh, services like debit card and uh, digital banking and mobile wallets and uh, all those key things is, is certainly part of that, but not the, the entire entirety. It's it's wrapping, making sure that that uh, customer is engaged and adopting other products and services as quickly as possible, puts them on the best foot. To be to be stickier as stickier than they would otherwise, and so that makes your investment in your prospect acquisition pay off all that all the more because you're keeping more of them. So, um, assuming that these three questions uh, make sense and resonate, 
we're going to walk through how to tackle each one in a little more detail. Uh, and like I said, uh, please do feel free to, to chat your question uh, as we go um, or, or raise your hand or those kind of things. So when we, when we think about understanding the relationship expansion opportunities, and then also this relates to um, on, you know, the other two as well, but primarily relationship, uh, our fundamental point of view is that uh, to get people to buy more things, uh, including customers that may have, may have already purchased one thing, but not other things, it's really important to understand each individual customer's capacity to buy for that, for that need and propensity. So capacity is the ability, the propensity is the inclination. Uh, and then of course, awareness is, is the, the proactive uh, steps taken based on that data to drive uh, some, to make sure somebody's aware of the offering uh, becomes even more critical in today's environment uh, where people are not walking into the branches nearly as often to handle those kind of weekly transactions. Um, you have to go out proactively uh, to make them aware of your product and services. And so when we talk about uh, the, the needs, there's really three key buckets over on that right-hand side. So uh, any, you know, any bank or credit union is going to borrow uh, fundamentally from the high depositors. Uh, we'll see... Um, shortly, that 95% um, of your deposits are held by high depositor, but every institution has a little bit different mix of, of high depositors versus low depositors. So that's your source of funding um, that we hopefully want to borrow from our depositors as, 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 uh, as least expensively as possible to lend to the act, to active credit or active borrowers, and whether that's consumers or businesses uh, or by per or securities. And then the transactors are those people who are actively using uh, us for money movement. Those end up being huge sources of fee income. And so the overlapping of these circles represent relationship banking. So as we can, if we can understand each individual's customer's capacity and propensity for these needs, we can build strategies to migrate them towards the center of the circle because the, the customer that is as a high depositor, active borrower and transactor uh, basically have to die to leave your bank. So they're very sticky, they're very high uh, revenue, and they're contributing sort of all three sources of, of economics to the bank in terms of funding, borrowing, and transacting. So that's, that's the framework we use. We've, we found uh, over hundreds and hundreds of institutions over decades, this framework to be very useful. And so um, using our deep benchmarks, what we can do is help in this planning process, understand specifically, not just penetration in each one of these areas, but how does that compare to peers? And so uh, analysis like uh, we're showing here on the slide, uh, this particular example bank had uh, some really nice growth potential uh, in the all three and the high depositor, the overlap of the high depositor plus active borrower. Uh, and they had a relative strength. So they're a little, little better penetration in the transactor bucket. So whether or not that's high depositor, transactor, or transactor only. So they had some strength to build upon in transactional penetration, but some real nice growth potential to, to, to build relationships in those other buckets. And so uh, this is that kind of outside perspective to help identify and understand relationship expansion activities. Uh, we drill a little bit further into uh, deposit tiering in terms of deposit uh, concentration. And so this chart um, tiers the entire deposit book uh, based on their level of household deposits. The high depositor are those groups between 10,000, uh, the, the, basically the top four rows on this chart, above 10,000 up to 250. And so what you see uh, in this particular case um, this this bank uh, has 96% of their funding held by depo high depositors, and that represents about 36% of their house, their deposit household, which is more concentrated than normal when you look at that 88 uh, index that's circled down the bottom left. Um, on the on the on the top top end of those high depositors, 
the households that uh, represent that that have over two hundred fifty thousand dollars on average uh, represent forty three point eight percent of their total deposit balances, even though it's three point five percent of the households. And those those households average four hundred four hundred fifty eight thousand dollars in deposit balances. So these households have very high capacity, but also very high propensity. And so in terms of prioritizing relationship expansion, there's a there's a huge retention impetus, but there's also a growth potential because, for example, if you look a little further to that top right uh, circle, you can see that um, only 70% of these households are, even have a checking account with the institution, but those that do have $169,000 of average balances. And so uh, when you think about uh, attracting relationships, uh, making sure there's a priority on defending and growing these relationships are going to have a are gonna have a huge uh, benefit um, compared to even attracting brand new relationships. So 160, uh, you know, a, a a household that that can contribute seventy six thousand or one hundred sixty nine thousand or even forty two thousand dollars of checking balances uh, by adopting that service. Is, a, is an example of why, it, why it's important to make sure that we're uh, maximizing that kind of opportunity uh, since those are gonna be very high uh, ROI. Uh, we can drill in further. So this chart on page nine is an example of looking at the granular product penetration, deposits, loans, services for high depositors, um, and then do, the, do a granular product penetration uh, benchmarking like on, on slide 10, uh, this is an, a different example. It's not necessarily the the, the previous uh, the previous one we were looking at, but you can see in this particular case, uh, there's actually a margin opportunity. So this this bank is a, is 41 percent uh, more penetrated in CDs that have 16 uh, percent higher average balances, and so that's a that's a potential margin uh, opportunity in in uh, perhaps being willing to give up a little bit of CD penetration to capture some margin. And on the flip side, there's a huge cross-sell gap in the savings and money market that are uh, well below peer. The peer average is that 100-yard line uh, that's that's the, the dotted line there. And so, um, you know, that so the, those are the kind of uh, based uh, understanding opportunities to grow from existing relationships that we're, that we're talking about. And so hey, that's Dan, the, yeah. Dan, excuse me. Um, we did have a question come in. Um, could you just uh, explain, you know, kind of how the, explain the indexes used is the question? Yeah, so the, it's a great question. The indexing, the 100 average here is a tool that we we use to let you see at a glance whether or not you're above or below your peer average. So uh, that, that 100, an, a 100 index basically means that you would be at, the peer average, um, a uh, so uh, looking at the one that's um, circled, uh, something if, if savings savings penetration is is roughly uh, one half of the of the peer average in this particular case. Now this is the the benchmarking, and so you could you could look at the the table to say okay, so that says that uh, it gives you the context of knowing whether or not that. Uh, that forty-two percent savings penetration is is high or low relative to peers. So yeah, great question. Um, so if you remember the strategic question of am I maximizing relationship expansion, this is a great uh, tool to understand what are those opportunities in relationship expansion. The next part of that equation is having in, having in place tracking to say, okay, based on programs that I may be running already, how am I tracking success? Uh, am I targeting people based on data-driven capacity and propensity factors? Am I really zeroing in on on uh, on households that have the the ability and inclination to buy what I'm selling? And then am I tracking all the way down to Awareness and impression, and what they're buying compared to what I'm uh, what I'm targeting them for uh, from a from a framework perspective. And so, dashboards like uh, the one I'm showing on page 12 uh, are uh, examples of when we work with clients on 
on uh, on campaigns and programs, we're giving them high level dashboards. They can see what is the actual um, activity that's occurring. So impressions, engagement against that activity in terms of clicks, responses in terms of people who are actually opening the targeted account. So uh, for example, that uh, second uh, highlighted uh, bar is uh, 500, 597 uh, CDs were opened against that campaign, representing 11.1% response rate. The balances on those CDs, halo balances or other things not targeted that were also opened, all compared to a, to a marketing expense. And so one of the things you'll see is, in this, in this example is, um, since Infusion works on a paper performance basis, the CPA is fixed. In this case, the client has a has a cap in place, so that they 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 collar that um, uh, that program. And so once we got to the cap, uh, the the CPA dropped to zero. And so uh, the average the average CPAs can tend to be below even than the than the the fixed CPA if there's a if there's a cap in place. And so that that CPA is a is a level of um, ROI or way to measure ROI. That illustrates. So these are all relationship expansion uh, tactics, and you'll see that uh, the, the CPAs are are much uh, less expensive for relationship ac activation than prospect acquisition. And so that's why sort of understanding what's happening today. Do I have active programs in place to take advantage of all these opportunities, and what's that cost to do it? Is kind of a foundation before we get to prospect acquisition. Uh, and so what's different about prospect acquisition and relationship expansion or cross-sell is uh, we don't know what the starting levels of awareness are for every, um, every prospect. Uh, every one of the prospects in your trade area uh, have different levels of awareness and consideration. Uh, customers already know about you, right? They have, they have, uh, they have accounts, they're, get, they're using your app. They're getting uh, emails and, and statements. So there's already a level of awareness with prospects. There's not that. And so that's why it takes time to optimize and it takes, uh, and, and, and there's a little bit less predictability uh, from, the, from the starting point because we got to zero in on what are the right targets and then build that awareness over time to march up towards a, um, what we would consider kind of a, a normative average uh, response rate. Uh, we've had we have we have clients though that are even exceeding the norm uh, based on multiple years of optimization in their particular objectives. Um, we accelerate that process with our analytical tools and methodologies, which we'll walk through a little bit more. Uh, but then what we what we found is the optimization process really has to have a very disciplined focus on what's the audience or the list we're using, what are the channels in place, what's the offer and creative and having a test and learn process to, to tweak and measure improvements uh, as we're pulling the levers on each one of those, each one of those things. Um, one of the ways that we jumpstart this, like, and I mentioned in the, in the opportunity, is trying to understand what are the highest propensity targets to start with. And so uh, we do at, uh, at, at the, we, we've worked with clients that to jump, to jumpstart this, we'll do an analysis and say, identify those pockets. So we'll, we'll use external data to classify every prospect uh, according to a lot of different dimensions, including 70 different demographic clusters or personas. Uh, we'll we'll append that same information to the customer base and then compare the mix of customers to the mix of prospects. And, and, and um, every time we've done this, we've identified between 10 and 20 clusters that the bank is doing way better than average uh, at attracting. And, um, and this goes beyond demographics. So there might be certain, so, so even banks that have an, a higher average age will have pockets of younger demographics that they're doing way better than average at attracting. And so identifying those, um, you might even call this a lookalike analysis, although it's uh, much more in depth than, than the kind of traditional lookalike analysis, but identifying 
these these prospects that are high 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 propensity based on what's the what specifically the bank has bank or credit union has done in the past gives us a jump start. And the reason I say we it gives us a jump start is page 15 illustrates some back testing that we've done on this process. So in this particular case, uh, we did we did some analysis. Um, the bank still wanted to, to to reach a pretty broad audience, and so this this was a great test case. Um, and so uh, what, what you see on this chart is the response rate. The dark blue bars are the response rates for each one of these. Uh, demographic clusters that I was talking about, what's the actual response rate across multiple campaigns for, for this client? The blue diamonds at the bottom show the ones that were predicted to be the highest propensity through the process that I was showing on the previous slide. And so what you'll notice is um, all but one of those is in the top half of the response on the left, on for me, the left side of the graph. And so that tells you that that's highly predictive uh, there were certain other things, you know, there, there was, uh, there, there's a uh, segment 22 that wasn't as predictive, right? And so that's why um, we can't just rely on that analysis, but it jumpstarts some things uh, and then it helps uh, through testing and refining what worked for that particular client uh, to be successful. The light gray bars on this graph are, are is the average response. This is a bank, so average response for banks. And so you can see uh, that some of the some of the um, performance that tends to be good for banks was indeed good for this bank. In some cases, even the the ones that were good for this bank, they were even better at. But on the flip side, there are certain uh, personas that are tend to be good for all banks overall that were not as good for this bank. And so that's why uh, there are brand specific elements that you know we can jumpstart the process, but there's always a, a testing and learning process. Uh, to, to dial this in. So that's, the aud that's an example of, of uh, jump-starting things and audience testing. I mentioned channels. Um, uh, a lot of work is happening in, in channels these days. So uh, what we found is using multiple channels matters and using the right mix of channels matters. And so um, what I'm showing on the slide now is a head-to-head -head test that we did for a bank where we tested a, a checking acquisition offer. So it's a pretty healthy offer, $300. You don't need to actually do a $300 offer. Uh, but this case, it was they were trying to attract a little more affluent audience. And so you can see the average balance uh, certainly reflected that, that targeting. But um, the, mix, uh, the mix on my left was a, was a combination of digital media and over-the-top TV or connected TV. Uh, and you can see that it drove a $22,000 average balance per responder. The media on the, the mix on the right, so everything was the same in this test. The targeting was a split test. The media, the offer, everything was the same except for the one that drove $22,000 had OTT or connected TV in it. The $16,000 average balance had a mix that included direct mail. And so you can see that the mix with OTT actually drove a $6,000 higher average balance, um, which is a really significant economic, economic benefit. There's also some lift in response rate, but the huge lift was in the quality of that responder. And again, the, the, the demographics of the list were identical. They were, the list was created and then randomly swip, split. So this is the kind of testing that's essential and constantly thinking about the right mix of channels, not just one channel. And so um, we use all of this uh, analysis to, th to think about what is the right um, plan to support the objectives identified in the, in the opportunity assessment. And so when we work with clients to build a plan as part of the planning process, we're creating, uh, for example, omnichannel outreach calendars that may have um, um, a, a variety of, of um, programs and objectives. This one's very heavy on relationship expansion, as you can see specific targeting 
um, specifically identified segments that, that have the capacity and propensity for each one of these product needs. So whether that's checking or a, or a premium checking upsell, a debit card, business checking, CD money, or, you know, each one of these needs, there's, you notice that the, the, the target number of households varies. That reflects that very specific targeting. And then omnichannel outreach uh, across multiple channels all the way through the year. So that's a kind of an always on aspect. Uh, another really key part of the planning process is a specific financial performer. And so we work with clients, um, uh, every client we work with, uh, before we do any work, we'll create a performa that builds upon experience from uh, all the different clients we work with and your specific data so that so the, 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 the performa uh, uh, calculates the impact that the plan can have on driving new accounts, uh, average balances based on your information to, to come up with a total balance, and then even a contribution impact. And so one of the, one of the things we found is you, is, is there's a trade-off in balance to, to balance to spread. And so in this particular case, uh, the the bank's uh, a key aspect that, aspect that pro forma was a mix of deposits that did not require a high rate, and so the three point one million of NIM benefit um, or spread spread benefit from growing low and moderate cost deposits uh, was probably even more important than than the, just the, the the gross volume generated because you're dr you're driving. Uh, volume at a reasonable cost of funds or accretive cost of funds uh, to help you to drive an overall net interest margin. So that's an example of a relationship expansion pro forma. One of the things you'll notice is this has a uh, a first year ROI of over 500%. Contrast that with prospect acquisition. So prospect acquisition, uh, for all the reasons we talked about, uh, the response rate is going to be lower. Therefore, the cost is going to be higher. And so um, prospect acquisition can, can have a good ROI. It takes a lot longer to build to that ROI. And you know, in this particular performa, you can see the, a steadily increasing uh, response rate based on that uh, optimization process. By the fourth quarter, it gets up to a pretty respectable 172% uh, 12 month ROI for a blended average, uh, you know, b basically double your money uh, ROI in the first year. But then this flywheel effect of, of, of having all that optimization work happen, really zeroing in on the right mix of audience, offer, channel mix, creative package that works for each individual bank, sets it up to have a, a, a really nice. Uh, kind of full year benefit in year two from all that hard work, uh, the journey, not a sprint effect of, of optimization in, the, in year one. Uh, some examples, uh, in case you're not familiar with uh, what an omnichannel mix may look like, some examples. So this particular case, there's a, um, th there's a video that's, a, that's an OTT or CTV video there's Instagram and Facebook ads, there's banner ads. So that's what I mean about kind of an omnichannel digital mix. Uh, this particular case uh, reflects uh, certain brand standards. You'll notice each one of these examples has its own branding reflected. I'll, and then some. there are some key aspects around positioning the, the product and offer, but it, it, each one reflects the unique brand voice. Uh, this particular case, uh, we had a $200 cash bonus offer um, Next slide is an example from business banking, uh, where they're obviously the, and here you know we we see you know multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars of average balance in, in business, uh, business checking, business prospecting, and so the, of course the, the uh, offer amount uh, varies. Uh, here's another example um, from a, from a different bank with a different set of brand standards, in, in the Midwest. Um, uh, yet another bank, and then. Uh, even with there's and so here's a great example of where the bank has unique brand assets like a um, like Mac Jones uh, up in the Boston area. We're incorporating those unique brand aspects into the overall 
message so it, so it supports the bigger brand objectives even while it's um, uh, driving to the, the specific direct response. Um, so how does all this work kind of come together? Um, how does this how does this approach uh, make a difference? Um, so let me, let me as, as we get towards the end, let me just walk through a very tangible uh, high level case study. We had a client that wanted to boost new to bank uh, prospect acquisition. Uh, they had done some things. They had done their kind of the random active marketing. They were dissatisfied with the tracking and targeting. They really didn't know what exactly they were getting or uh, whether or not it could be better. And so we performed the kind of detailed demographic analysis that we talked about earlier to identify those highest potential areas to start. Uh, built the whole, went through the whole process of analyzing opportunity, building, supporting them with the planning options, and then doing uh, an execution. And so in the first year, uh, new to bank households improved 19% in year one, which was reversing a declining trend. Uh, and also the program improved the CPA uh, by, by 2x. And so in terms of other Key, key stats, and this is, this is an example of that optimization process in action. Q1, we saw $3.8 million of balances. Q4, $8 million of balances generated in Q4. Number of accounts, Q1, 319, Q4, 414. Um, and then the, the cost per account went in half. Part of that is because they actually started off pretty broad, and then we, actually, we narrowed down the... Um, uh, the audience over time. And so the, the, the last campaign was was smaller quantity than the first. And so it's all those things added up. That's what drove that cost per account. And then so, you know, we, we, when we have campaigns and programs that are into year two and three, uh, we've seen uh, sustained CPAs uh, even below 250 in one case, you know, a couple of cases, even below 200. And so uh, there's that, there, there's that optimization process in action that, that you can even see in, in, this, uh, in this example. And so as we get towards the end of the monologue part, get ready for some additional questions, uh, really the three key, key takeaways to winning in prospect acquisition based on our you know, decades of experience and experience working with hundreds of banks is, uh, number one, ensure a solid relationship expansion foundation is in place before generating new to bank leads. Um, the ROI is much much uh, higher, and you're doing uh, a double duty of defending and expanding existing relationships before you go out and get new ones. But when you're, when you're ready to do, uh, to boost new account acquisition or new household acquisition, a systematic discipline process is really essential. And so the process, like I outlined, we of course believe in this very, very much. We'd love to talk to you about it um, further is essential, that, that commitment to doing testing and learning over at least a year, uh, because sometimes the the, pro, the the path is not necessarily a straight line, but we we have a uh, you know over ninety percent track record of getting to the levels of optimization that we're talking about here by the by the fourth or fifth quarter of a campaign, and then data driven financially accountable marketing should keep be a key growth driver, right? So if you're if you don't have in place the kind of detailed uh, data-driven process and tracking uh, and, and, and uh, discipline that we've walked through, uh, we would love to work. We would love to talk to you more, uh, explore how we could help. Um, I'll mention that uh, participants on of this webinar uh, that would like for us to do an opportunity assessment to look at your data and sort of help you understand what are those pockets of opportunity, uh, both relationship and prospect. Uh, that are at play and and then you know give you a sense of what we could work with you on a paper performance basis where we're investing our money in your success and you're only paying for success. Uh, we'd love to talk to you about that and we would be happy to waive the the typical fee for that opportunity assessment because you participated in this webinar. And so I'd love to take your questions uh, either either here or um, as a follow up and um, I think Sean's going to come on, come back on to help facilitate that. Uh, we will send out this deck and include some contact information. But what uh, what questions do you have for us right now? Yeah, as uh, 
Thanks, Dan. Yeah. So again, if you have any uh, questions you'd like to submit, go ahead and use the chat box or just the Q and A uh, icon, and uh, we will will take those. Um, and you know, as Dan, you know, uh, kind of presented to you today, right? There's a number of different areas where uh, you know infusion can can certainly help you. Whether it's just you know initially kind of getting that opportunity assessment, you know, assisting you in, in reviewing with you what you're currently doing, or you know, obviously taking a further step to to work fully with infusion. But uh, as he indicated, certainly welcome the opportunity to assist you in any number of ways. So the first question that came in is is how long does it take to get up and running? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, really the biggest variable is in how fast we can get the files from you to do the initial opportunity assessment. Uh, but we've had programs up and run. I mean, it's, it's very typical that from opportunity assessment um, and you look at a performa, we can be up and running in market in 90 days. Thank you, Dan. Uh, again, if you have any additional questions, go ahead and submit those now. <clears throat> While we wait to see if there's any more questions, uh, Dan, as you can see, put up his in contact information as well as uh, Trevor's uh, contact information. Uh, as we indicated, you will get a copy of the slides today along with a link to the recording and a follow-up uh, email. Um, and I don't see any additional questions. So if anything comes up between uh, now and then, you know, maybe here in a little bit, just uh, reach out to Dan, Trevor, or myself, or any of the uh, folks here at QuickRate, and we will get you in contact with the appropriate people uh, and look forward to seeing you on a future QuickRate or Infusion webinar. And thank you very much for your time today. Dan, any final uh, words before we let everybody go? Yeah, thanks for your time. Look forward to following up. Awesome. Thanks to Dan. Thanks to all of you for taking time out of your day, and we'll look forward to seeing you again. And please let us know if we can help. Have a great day. Thank you.